All right, good evening and welcome back to the shop. It's good to have you hanging out here tonight. Tonight we're going to get back to basics. We're going to talk about routers and using them. Now I understand some of you are router junkies and have a real problem. We need to talk. I have an issue myself, but I don't think it's as bad as some of you, so I can, you know, make myself feel better that way. But I am uh, really speaking to people who are just getting into it and don't want to hurt themselves and do effective work. Because <laughs> they are confusing at first. And then I'm going to show you actually how I make a simple circle jig and um, cut out round tops pretty effectively and easily. So we got that coming up. But if you're new or if you like this content and you'd like to subscribe, that would be awesome. That would help us. And why not? You're always hanging out with me anyway. So you can do that by pushing the subscribe button and ringing that bell so you get all our notifications. But really to connect with us, if you subscribe to our, um, our webpage at epicwoodworking.com, <laughs> I'm sorry. The camera lady's mouth is like <laughs> smiling and, and going like, and I'm trying to <laughs> say, <laughs> you don't Our even realize you do list. that. It's the mailing list. So we the can mailing email list. you. She's, her yes. mouth was saying mailing list. All right. Mailing list. So now you know. Yes. The mailing list. At epicwoodworking.com. It's right there on our homepage, or there's a link in the description also. All right. I couldn't have said it better. But... <laughs> That's a great way to hear everything that we've got going on, and we've got some new stuff. We've been saying this coming up, and um, we're excited to share some new things this year. So much has gone on. I know it's stressful, you know, like with all the pandemic and everything, but um, so we're not going to hit you with anything right off the bat, but at the same time, we love just hanging out because this is really where the stuff of life happens where we're creative, we're expressing ourselves, we're sharing our gifts and love with the world. So that's what we're going to do tonight. All right, so we're going to continue on with our router introduction. Um, this is not exhaustive. I've been using routers so long that I forget some of the basic questions. So if, um, if you have any questions throughout this, feel free text them in and we will get to them as best we can. So I just want to show you a couple different routers I have here. Um, the basic two types you can get are fixed bases and plunge bases. So the fixed base of which I don't even have one, actually this one came with a fixed base and a plunge base. and. As soon as I got it, I can't remember which one was on there. I just immediately put the plunge on there because um, I'm looking at it, trying to say what would be the advantage of having the fixed base. It looks like you get the exact same depth of a plunge with either. So um, I, don't, I don't have a good reason for the fix, although they are less expensive. So um, if you're going to set up Routers, you could actually set them up to do certain operations. And if you knew you're re recreating the same operation all the time, just leave that bit right in there. And that's when a fixed router bit is great if you're coming in from the side. So fixed router bases are mainly for edging material. They're not great at plunging because they're fixed and the bit is already sticking out in whatever depth you want and if you try to plunge with it sometimes it can get a little hairy. That's the beauty about routers is they can do amazing fast work for you but they can also do a lot of damage and if you've been using routers for any length of time you probably have a story or two where you kind of wrecked something nice and it got away from you and it just took a quick little a little bite and next thing you know you're spending an hour like, or more trying to patch that up. Or maybe it's destroyed. <laughs> Who knows? But routers have actually been the reason I've gotten pretty good at making patches 
almost invisible. You gotta, you gotta do that. Now, I want to show you just, uh, these were the old time routers. These molding planes. Before routers existed, the way they created nice moldings with all different shaped molding planes like this. All usually made out of wood. Well, I can't think of any metal ones. I guess there are some Stanley ones that were made out of metal, but the wood one was dedicated. So this is a nice bead. This will make like a nice full quarter inch bead. And I actually um, tuned this up for a friend of mine who did it to all the wainscoting in his period house here in town. And he just borrowed it and, excuse me, and so it got a little tear out. It looked very authentic at the end because it wasn't like a router. It was a little bit different, you know, and it came right off of this plane. So these types of molding planes were awesome, but they were limited. Can you guess why? Because the vast majority, Let me get a I can't, up of that. can you see that? You got the shape in the wood and then the cutting edge, the iron, is perfectly shaped to conform to that same piece. Mm. So these were all the rage. Uh, like a good finished carpenter would have multiples of these in his um, box and cabinet makers. And they're really fun to collect if, because um, you don't have to pay much money to get them. Um, but there are even some guys making them. Now there's a guy who's been up at the, somebody can type in if you remember his name. But I mean, it boggles my mind how he thought this was a good business decision. You know, like to start making molding planes that were virtually put out of business by routers. Um, but somehow he's made it. He makes these most beautiful so artwork. Nice, yeah. um, molding planes they're spectacular and they're not cheap but they're works of art and they work beautifully so the only drawback with them is besides the amount of time it takes it is so much more fun and it's not going to do a massive mistake on you like in a heartbeat right you have more control but it um they don't go around corners very well they don't make circles very well see it's kind of an issue there because it's kind of straight. But so you've got a problem with making rounded shapes with molding planes. That's where the router is just ready to go and works beautifully. Now, I'm going to not deal with the um, fixed base at all, but I just, I'll just show you a couple of these. This is a, the smallest I have. I'm trying to remember. How many horsepower this is? I thought I would see it right away, but um, I don't. It's type one. Somebody probably knows. It's on here somewhere. But sometimes called a laminate trimmer. It's just a small, sweet router. These new modern ones um, have a light, have LED lights under there. So I bet that's why some of you had to buy new ones because you could not live without lighting down there. <laughs> And it is so nice because you kick it on and the light is right where you need it underneath there. This is the only lighted one I've got here. But so that's a smaller horsepower. This is the um, one of the largest I have. It's the, I've mentioned this before, you've seen me use it. It's a three horsepower, the DW625 DeWalt. Really nice router, um, plunges nicely and easily. People are going to think this is a sales I know. video, but it's not. <laughs> no, it's not at all. Show you what we They're have. not a sponsor. And, um, but this is a nice router. It uh, was originally made by ELU, E-L-U, and then DeWalt bought them out and didn't change anything, which I love because I had the ELU for a while and uh, really nice. It has a soft start. It just doesn't, doesn't twist in your hand when it starts, and it just... Nice, strong plunge router. And these routers, you know, you can add a plastic base to them and put them upside down in your router table um, or whatever.
kind of base you want to use, and you'd be good to go. Here's the Festool. Um, I guess they refer to this as the D handle. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. What's cool about this is it's you, I often use it two-handed, but I have used it when you're making a lighter cut. You can just use it with one hand. Um, it's a little trickier, but if, you, if it's not a heavy cut, why not? Um, you do want to practice safety, though. <laughs> Only cut one hand instead of two. <laughs> yeah, make sure your other hand is not in the way. That's the nice thing about having two hands on there. Neither hand can get cut, right? So uh, nothing to joke about safety. <laughs> Sorry. I never joke about safety. I'm not joking. I, sometimes people think I'm a little lax with safety. Matt not. Bickford is his name. I have on my hand. Yes, what's his name again? Matt Bickford. Matt Bickford, yeah. Thank you, yes. Great Check practice. him out. Do a search. If you're interested in molding planes, it'll blow your mind how sweet those are. Um, and this one, wow, what is with the uh, European, I don't know, this doesn't have horsepower on it either. Somebody will have to tell me. It doesn't really matter. They're telling you. It's good. What is it, around a two? Well, it was a ways back, so keep going. Okay, this is the OF1400 EQ. No, they were telling me for this one, oh, okay. the little one. Anyway, um, this is a sweet plunge router, too. It's got all those bells and whistles of the Fest tool. You know, super nice adjustments, and um, you can dial it in and adjust all that. The DeWalt's nice, too. It has this. This is the adjustment. Sometimes it's a pain, though, because... You'll have this up high, and while you're running it, it'll be rattling and, and dialing down like this. So when you go to raise up, it, uh, it won't go up because that's floated down. I have cured that by putting some tape on there, but I bet somebody out there has a solution. You guys always come to my rescue for my dumb little issues I have. <laughs> but I think there's like some gum in there or something. <laughs> Some kind of sticky something or other to keep it from falling. Something a little more elegant than when I put tape around the bottom. It doesn't look good. All right, so I'm going to set this one aside for a few minutes. And uh, Tom, do you have a, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to answer any of this question about bits later. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some bits. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you pieces. the question and you can see if this is a good time. A little bit. What? Mark's asking, what do you think about pattern bits that have a bearing on both the top and bottom? Oh. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that, Mark, in a few minutes. I'll show you one that I have. I only, I think well, I only have one That elicited some groan, kind of. That's interesting. No, I was just thinking. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't groaning. I was uh, good. just thinking about it. So I also have this Triton that I got a while back, too. Um, this might have been my second or third. I've had others that I've worn out on Bosch that worked well for so many years. I've got uh, Milwaukee. And, but this one, this one's pretty sweet for the adjustment factor. Um, I love how it's in your hand, and you just turn it like that to dial it up and down. It was always, and then it stops. And if you want to micro adjust, you just turn this little knob here. This was made in Australia. Pretty nice. And it's another beefy, powered up. Uh, I'm going to not know the horsepower again. Oh, wait. What? I must be not knowing. See, I'm not very electrically inclined. I'm not. I, you know, sometimes you don't have to say <laughs> things. <laughs> Sometimes you really don't have to state the obvious, but, <laughs> but I like what they can do, but I don't need to know everything about them. And I do know a lot about using them, but as far as the electrical part of it, not, not that into it. But I know this is a powerful router. Um, but here's the thing. I learned this way back. Uh, one of the most critical aspects of a router is the kind of collet that it has. And the collet is what holds the bit in the spindle, okay? So here's the Fest tool, and let me show you the DeWalt. 
Here's the DeWalt. So see these two? This is the Fest tool. These are both half inch collets. And they've got this secondary sleeve behind the knot. So, and it's pretty long and deep there. So you get a really nice grab on the bit. So you want a lot of the shank in there. You, want, you don't want any more sticking out than needs to be. So the one downside about this Triton, and I never like speaking bad about tools, but this is the one thing. This is the collet. It's a little disappointing. When everything else on that is so good, I mean, look at it has no interior sleeve. It's very short in length. And it's just a split uh, thread on the, the nut here. So when you thread it in, this is it. So you don't have that added length or that second interior sleeve that really gives you a longer, deeper grab on that piece. So this is fine, but I would get nervous sometimes when I have a longer bit in that. If I was on the table, like say a bit like this, you know, you're only working with a certain amount of that shank in there. It kind of makes you're a little nervous. See, that only goes in that far. I'm not even, I still got half an inch of that shank there. I would be nervous to run this bit on this router. Maybe they've changed that since, if you guys know. Whereas on this one, we can get the full shank in there, which you want on these longer bits because there's more mass out there. Now, the likelihood of them spinning and flying off is pretty low because of the centrifugal force. I'm sure some of you could explain. Uh -huh. I mean, tell me about this. Like, how, how secure is a spinning router bit? I mean, they're spinning. If you think of it like you get that gyro action, they're spinning. And on the DeWalt, you have an adjustment of speeds from 8,000 to 22,000 RPMs. So that's a lot of spinning. And that creates this kind of stability. It wants to stay in the center. But still, when you start working with it, if anything broke on that thing, it just, I would feel better with a better call it system. So um, I still use the Triton. It's, it's a good one. Although I'm not using it right now because there's something wrong with the switch. And you know, it's one of those things. Where are you going to take that to get fixed? I'm going to set this aside, though. Here we go. I'm going to put this back. And let's talk some bits, OK? There's a few different kinds of bits. And then we'll make a few cuts. And hopefully don't um, do any damage to our material. All right, so here we go. Excuse me, Miss Camel Lady. I'm with you. I, I'm going to look down here at the bits Okay, now. awesome. It's hard to know that when you're reading. Sorry, you're right. No, that's good. You're getting all the, I don't know how you do what you do, multitasking like that. Wow, you have a lot of this. This isn't even all my bits. <laughs> 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 no, this is a small sampling. Um, but I put them out here to show you some straight cutters. So typically... Um, what you basically have with bits is you have guided bits that have an inbuilt bearing. So this bearing, this is a flush cut, two inch flush cut. It's a three quarter inch diameter with the bearing on the bottom like that. So if it's riding against a pattern or the material, it's going to be on the bottom and the plate of your router is here. So it's pretty secure. It's hard to overcut that because the bearing is stopping you from making too much of an overcut. Here's the same bit, but with the reverse. It's got the bearing at the top, and it's got some gunk on it. <laughs> but this, so this is the same bit, but now you have the guide bearing down here. So when it's in the router, the router plate is about here, say, and the bearing is riding against whatever pattern. So let me turn it this way as if I was using the router. And 
the pattern is here. So if you bobble it all, you actually can overcut with this one much more easily. I usually would use this in a table anyway. It would be in a table and you would have a template that would ride against that bearing. But there's something about it spinning up there that you don't feel quite as secure because there's no bearing on the top. But uh, So you have bits with bearings included. Now, most of these, if you scan them, have bearings. Like almost all of these roundovers come with a bearing at the bottom. Um, all these roundover bits. And then we have these chamfer 45 degree bits. Um, almost all of these do. And slot cutters and cove cutters here. And then a little more subtle roundovers. But they all have these bearings which you don't have to use. If you use it with a fence or a table, you don't have to expose it all the way to the bearing. You can only use it. You can use a partial or whatever. But then there's other bits that don't have any bearings attached. Usually those are straight um, or they could be dovetailed and like these. And you're going to use those with some other kind of guide system. So, uh, but let me go back to that earlier question because this is the only cutter I have with two bearings. Um, I, I like them. I mean, I, why not? I mean, you're usually, it gives you the option of using either end. Now, this is the, the bit by infinity. Yeah, infinity. And this is the bigger one. I'm telling you, that has some good weight to it. I don't know, it feels like a couple pounds. <laughs> not quite, maybe. But uh, it feels over a pound. And... Uh, but it gives you two options. It has that really great built-in shearing cuts. So you could use either the bottom or the top bearing. It depends what situation you're in. If you want to use the bottom guide or the top, you don't have to extend the whole thing out. But this is so heavy, it's kind of, it's almost too much to use with a smaller router because it's so heavy to use and it feels like it strains the motor a bit. Um, so. I would, they make another one that's a little smaller shank, and I think they're pushing that one more these days. But that's a beautiful bit, and it does an awesome job flush cutting because of that shearing angle of the cutters instead of hitting straight like that. And it's nice to have that double-sided. That's a, that's two-inch cutter right there. And that's the inch and a half, I think. Um, so... Then we have another straight cutter here with a replaceable guide bearings. And this is a little rabbit joint cutter. So you can put on, it can substitute this bearing, which is the full diameter, and it becomes a flush cut bearing. The one I have in there is 1 8 inch smaller than the overall diameter. So I create a 1 16 inch offset. And I used that recently when I made those tables I showed you last week. When I inlaid that ebony line around the top edge, I just plunged about, I don't they weren't even an eighth inch thick, and made a very shallow 16th inch cut all around the side. Now sometimes you can take that, I can take that one off, and I would substitute with that bearing which is a full quarter inch smaller, so I get a one eighth offset. But you know, sometimes that eighth is too much, and this is how nerdy I am. I will wrap tape around. This one's adjusted to be like a 332nd, um, because actually I like that most when I'm putting those lines around the tops of table edges. Some about 332nd just works better than <coughs> the other two. Do you have a favorite brand or bit? <coughs> um, um, brand bit or brand to stay away from? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm. See, this is where I'm not like a tool expert, but I like white side bits. I used to always buy a mana bits. I don't see those around as much. Um, sometimes I just want a cheap bit because I'm not. It doesn't have to do anything fancy. Uh, there's some places that'll sell you really cheap bits. You can tell they're made in China and they're 
Sometimes they're scary. So it's really not worth buying the super cheap bits if it's a heavy bit. But if it's a smaller light cutter, um, I don't have a problem with it. But for instance, I did that on a bit like this. And look at that bit. This is one I got from this, I think it was called price cutter. <laughs> but I never feel safe. This is a big hunk of metal right there, right? And that, I don't even think it's perfectly balanced. So I don't even use this anymore. That, that I don't know why I have it. Are you partial to carbide? Yeah, I mean, almost all of them come with a carbide edge. So, yes, I mean, I like one that lasts a long time. You can set them out to be sharpened. I was just talking recently uh, with someone about getting bit sharpened. And we used to have a guy in town here, but he's no longer in business. So nobody knows where to go anymore. And someone said Ridge Carbide, that company is good to send. They'll do router bits and everything. But if anybody's got any suggestions for a good source to get your router bits sharpened, that would be good to share. Are you able to show how you store your router bits? Yeah, sure. Um, let me just finish talking about these. These are the uh, slot cutters and of different types. This is where I'll make my own splines. Um, you can use, I think this one's almost the exact same as a biscuit cutter. And this one is the Itsy Bit from Woodhaven. And those are nice because you have these biscuits that they'll, they're like little footballs, but they're much small, smaller, smaller. <laughs> and uh, so you don't need as wide a piece. You can use them on styles of cabinets and, and they'll fit in there nicely. Or, but once you get a domino, you don't use this as much. <laughs> but it's a really nice bit. And then we have the dovetails. These are a couple nice roundovers. You've seen me doing that pillowed cutting on things. This one I've mentioned in other courses. When we do that, um, that table that has the, uh, the cloud console table mm -hmm. that we'll be doing as a project pretty soon, uh, we will use this bit and I'll reference the number of it. And this one I had custom made to give me that soft radius on a lot of larger pieces that I've made, but it was pretty poorly made. I mean, look at how, even the shank, it wasn't even, it's not even true, true. But <laughs> you see the shiny spots where it hit. They must have sent overseas for this to have it made, and it's just kind of, but it's actually, it's done a lot of nice work for me. And my largest roundover is this inch and a half roundover, and I've used that to make giant bullnose on thick tabletops that were like three inch. And, um, but one thing I want to say about router bits to remember is you, you buy the shape, but there's many shapes within each cutter, depending on the depth you plunge. So, you know, I, I rarely use the full roundover. You've seen me lots of times, I'll just, like last week, we just did a slight cut of this very bit. This is a 5 8 roundover. And I didn't use the whole thing because I just wanted a subtle effect of the roundover. So it's all in the depth you set and the way you set your fence or whatever. So, <clears throat> so I'll show you. Um, I do store them in here. You want to come in and okay. look? I need more slots. But this is my router bit drawer. So I just took those out of here. You see the holes? And um, there's more, obviously. But more straight cutters, mostly. Um, some shape. This has a nice bead. Some specialty bits. But I don't run moldings like I used to uh, with 18th century furniture. That... We used to have molded edges, and quite often those would be recreated by running several bits and not having the exact shape. But it was okay because you could always work it out. You can buy, like I did here, a custom bit if you need that perfect shape. So, anyway, I'm going to just slide these over rather than put them away right now.
on that monster bit that you showed us, Tony? Would would you slow down? Oh you slow yeah, down thank you. It, yeah, like this, asking? this, or this. I guess it doesn't. I work. think the one prior to the red one. Oh. The really big chunky one. You would. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, when I ran it on my table, I didn't have adjust speed adjustment. I don't think. Um, so I just let it ride. <laughs> but it's scary. I wouldn't. Uh, most bits will come with an advisement of the speed to run them. So the larger the diameter, you really want to tone it down. This should be toned down a little bit. Maybe I did adjust that one. Um, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've used it. But where you have that range of 8,000 to 22,000, you don't want to run like you wouldn't run this one at 22,000. You got this wing out here. The speed way out here is way faster. So you got to be careful. I never try to run really wide bits. Um, used to see um, raised panel cutters, you know, on that horizontal. And rather than have that, I would usually instead get the raised panel cut cutter. Can you see that against my shirt? Get it cut vertically. This was a special custom bit for some cabinets I made when I was down in North Carolina to reproduce some period cabinets. Had a nice raised panel and then a bead right before the center. And by hold, having it up on edge, I ran the, the panels vertically. And so you don't have all that mass spinning. You could run this at the full speed, much safer and a better way of doing it. But it did require a custom buy here. But um, I don't know if, if they sell raised panel bits like that. You, somebody can chime in. I haven't shopped for one for a while. So um, if somebody knows where to get them with that orientation. I also would be interested in hearing your comments on what the best bits are. Like, what are your favorite brands? Um, They're already saying some of that. Um, okay, good. Whiteside was up there. Yeah. So I have a couple other questions. This is a good time. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. uh, John's asking, why do the guide bearings always leave a track on the wood, even if it is freely spinning? Oh, uh, um, well, you know, I used to have this bearing lube. They do still make it, I'm sure. And I, you just spritz a little, and it was like the bearing would really fly. It really shouldn't make a mark if it's freely spinning, because once you're working against, you're just rolling on the bearing. However, I know that feeling. You do sometimes get the line, especially with my, um, my taped bearing. That always like grabbed a little more, <laughs> and here it goes, zzz, like it, it uh, definitely was burnishing the wood a little bit. But I've never found that to be a big problem because I got to come back and clean it up and sand it anyway, and the bearing would never make a mark that was a problem to me because it's not even cutting really. But. Okay, Tom's asking, does sharpening the bit change the diameter of the cut? Yes, I mean, technically, subtly it does, uh, but let me think about that. I, I know, I've often thought about that. Someone else will have to answer that, because I don't, when you sharpen, when you sharpen a flush cut bearing like that, I think they do hit more, yeah, if you hit either surface, you're going to slightly change it. I don't think it's enough to worry about. You can probably get a few sharpenings. But um, someone can speak to that. I'm not, that's a good question. I know, I know it, does, it has to, but you can get them sharpened. So there's probably a certain point at which that bearing no longer is giving you the intended start out shape. So. What do you use for rule joints, Jeff is asking? Oh, good question. Uh, it's been a while since I made a rule joint table, but I would use... I used a cove like that. I think it was a half inch and a half inch for the other. See that? So I usually use a half inch round over because the tables tend to be like about three quarters of an inch thick. Um, you can go, I'm trying to think, it's been a while. But it, there's something about when it rolls down, <laughs> I haven't even thought of it for a while. You definitely have to have it so that 
there's no gap there when it comes down. So um, it's where the barrel of the hinge is on the, the joint. But I'm pretty sure, as I recall, I used two half inch, the opposite of a cove and a bead, and setting the depth and working it out. Um, you got you to gotta map that out on the, I always would draw the profile and then show where the barrel of the hinge is going to be, the center of that barrel, because that's the axis when that comes down, it's going to describe like you, that, the, the outer piece that folds down cannot reveal a gap. It has to be high enough. So anyway, I don't, I'm getting in the weeds. But uh, <laughs> that's what I use. Get out of the weeds. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question that I'm going to ask correctly, but I just have the question, square bearings, avoid buildup of resins and glue. Like maybe how do you do that on square bearings? Is that what that means? Square bearings? Maybe I need a little more clarity on that question. I'm not sure. If you can try again, maybe you. Sorry. Um, Mike's asking, is there anything to say about keeping the col collet clean or lightly waxed slash lubed? Uh, Mike, I don't know. Um, I don't want to put any lubricant on the collet. There may be something to that, but I would keep it clean maybe every now and then. Hit it with a uh, steel, steel wool. You could see the outside of mine, but you know, the inside, you want that to grab. So I'm not going to put any lubricant on there, but you don't want any rust in there or any, anything like that. So hitting, excuse me, hitting everything with uh, steel wool is a good idea. How about setup of miter lock router bits? Oh, I can't get into that tonight, but I actually have miter. I don't know where they are. It's a single cutter. Where is that thing? Um, but it's it's made to run. It's I think it comes with a diagram, but it has it's a miter, but it's got a little tooth lock, and you run one piece horizontally, and the second piece goes vertically, and when you put them together, they come together with like a puzzle piece on the miter. So it's pretty sweet. You get stronger miter that way, but Whenever I'm doing that, I, I have multiple test pieces just to make sure because you've got to get that height just right. And I think what you get dialed in is pretty good. As long as your material is the same thickness, it's not that bad. But it comes, I think it comes with a diagram. It's not that, it's not as bad as you think it's set up. Okay. Probably go ahead. Okay. So I'm just going to do a little routing. Um, I'll just do a quick route here. I haven't used this bit in so long. I'm going to do a straight cut. All right, we'll use the Festool. And this is a, like an OG bit. It has that, that cove and then the bead and a little fillet on the end. And I'm going to only use a partial of this. Let's just put a little cut on this, um, this board here. And... Do you need a little more cowbell, Tom? More cowbell? <laughs> Why? It's being, it's being uh, mentioned that you sound a little bit like Christopher Walken. I do? <laughs> what do you mean? How does he talk? <laughs> Not to distract you. I got a, <laughs> I got a fever <laughs> for more cowbell. <laughs> Do I sound like Christopher uh, Walken today? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. He's he's the kind of guy you hang on every word because he's got a fever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to clamp this on the edge so I can get all sides. Now, um, I know most people watching may know this, but this this is a pretty key point I want to show really quickly here. Um, I'm gonna. I have a, like a shelf here, let's say it's a shelf, and I'm just going to do these three edges. So this is the long board, the grain is running this way. So I bring in my cutter, and here's my, my router bed here. 
I'm going to just go around this edge. But my router bit, as I look down on it, it's always spinning clockwise like that. Sort of like a hurricane, right? I think that's how hurricanes are. No, they go the other way. In the northern hemisphere, <laughs> they, they go the other way. This is true, I think, in the southern hemisphere. All right, so anyhow, there's my router bit spinning like that. So that cutter is slamming into the work like downward like that. So when I'm coming down here, I have to be careful when I get to the end of the cut because the fibers are like this. And when it exits the cut, sometimes you can get fibers break out like that on the end. The way to prevent that is you can put a backer piece. Um, I don't always do that. If you have a sharp blade, a sharp cutter, and um, you go slowly, you'll be fine there. Sometimes you can back it up. Let's just try this. I haven't used this in a while. So it's only going to happen on this corner. Because when I'm at the other corner, I'll be going, the cutter will be pulling in. I won't be blowing, wanting to blow any fibers out. So I'm going to put some, a couple pieces of tape on here. Let's see if this works. This bit is used, too, so it's not super sharp. I might get some tear out. But I'm going to try to be slow and careful when I get there. Now I want to set the depth. I'm not, going to, I'm not even going to use the full depth of this bit. Notice I have it unplugged. So I'm not going to. Let's change the adjustment here. I'm just going to bring the depth up. I think right about there looks good. What's the best place for me to film this process? Um, you, you're good right there. All right, that's good. I'm not trying to be too fancy here. All right, so I'm going to plug this in and let's make some dust. Get my goggles on. So I'm going to start. I put, <laughs> I put on my earphone hearing it. Oh, did you turn it down already? Okay. I was talking really loud, I could tell once I put those on. So I'm going to start here and work it toward me and just slowly exit. And I want to be sure I don't let the bearing roll around the corner. Okay. So now I'm also, I also have enough sticking out here that I'll do it in some lighter passes. Um, I could have set the depth a couple times, but I'm just going to take a light cut here and then I'll keep coming in until I feel the bearing rolling on the workpiece. All right, here we go. Okay, so before I run the front straight, I just want to show you this one I went a little more aggressively, and you can see this is what happens. You get, that's a piece of tear out. 
So you wouldn't want that. Um, if this was a shelf and you knew you could still take some material off, like sometimes you might, if you have enough material, go ahead and route it and then you could rip it to the actual width if this were a shelf. Um, but this is the front edge, okay? So I don't mind that. I'm gonna take it away with my next cut. I wanted to stop so I could just say that whenever I'm routing around four sides, I'll always make sure my last pass is a long cut with the grain so that if there is any tear out, it comes away. So I always start with a cross cut, long cut, cross cut, long cut, and you end up without uh, worrying about this, okay? So now I'm gonna make that final cut and let's see how the tape den survived. Camera lady is going to get extra pay. <laughs> <laughs> she was almost I don't know how in the, exciting it is, but you're almost in the uh, the direction of the shavings coming off, but I don't think so. So I usually like to use a router like that. I like the ex extra plate. I have a larger plate that I secure to the Dewalt that um, gives you a more stable feeling. When that's open like that, it's kind of shaky when you get to the corner. Like I noticed I just didn't get quite all that. I could come back or I could just knock that off of the plane. It'd be pretty good. But there you have it, a nice little shelf. So I would set the shelf like this and it would give you the appearance of a thinner shelf. But let's see how that corner turned out where we put the tape to reinforce. You can see we didn't get any tear out. So with light cuts and a little sanding will take that fuzz off, but there's no big um, splinters or anything like that on that corner. So that's nice. I have a question, but I, I, you may have just answered it, but I want to make sure that it gets addressed in case there's something I don't know. Okay. okay. Can you talk about router direction outside and inside? Did you cover that? I'm going to, in a second, I'll talk more. Okay. But um, when you're routing, you noticed when I was routing that whole time, I was pulling it toward me. So I had the router on there, and I'm looking down at it, and I'm spinning clockwise. So I'm pulling it toward me. So I'm always pulling against the spin of the bit. I want to be pulling into it. If you go with the bit, which is called a climb cut, if you go with the spin and I push it away from me, it wants to take a big jump. However, climb cutting is okay if you're only taking a light cut because you'll be able to still control it. But when you're not pulling against it, you cannot control it if it decides to grab. Like when you're pulling into it, it can't grab because you have the control and you're pulling toward you. But when you're climb cutting, it's gotta be light, and you gotta just do a nice controlled speed. The beauty of the climb cut is it leaves you a little cleaner surface if you're going into the grain. So let me show you one other diagram here. We're going to do a round piece right now, a quick cut on a round piece. So. When you're doing a round top of solid wood, all the, the grain is coming in one direction, pretty much. So when I, I'm coming in with my bit again, 
and it's spinning this way, it's going to be spinning friendly to these fibers. These fibers are coming out like this, and we're going to be kind of pulling down on them. The fibers are just being pushed down into the wood as you come around the corner. So you get a nice smooth cut when you go around there. But when you get down to this corner, corner, <laughs> it's not a corner. When you get down to this quadrant, it's a circle. You're going to have your bit, again, this way, spinning like that. Now it's spinning into the fibers that are sticking out and they don't have backing. So it, this, in this quadrant here, it wants to tear out because it's feeling the ends of the grain more than here because it's coming up behind them. Here, it's coming in behind. Here it's coming into them. So you get more of a potential for tear out on this quadrant and this quadrant here, these two. They, these two are fine, no worries. So we're going to do a, a top here quickly, and um, I'll talk about the technique there, the pull cut and the climb cut and the spin. So I'm always going to be pulling it toward me here. So let me um, get my little circle jiggy thing out. Let's make a little round top out of this. And I'm going to show you my quick and dirty circle jig. So this is, this is your circle jig. This is all you need. It's just a piece of plywood or MDF. Um, I commonly use three quarter M M MDF. And I've made long ones of these where you're cut, pulling radiuses that are you know, four feet. So you're getting a four foot radius, which would make an eight foot circle. But regardless, we just want a little, like a 17 and a half ish top here. And so I marked the center here on my table. I'm going to do this on the underside of the table. Now, I'm going to do this. Um, you can do this two ways, but I'll, I'll just show you the template first, how, the, how this jig works if you haven't seen this. And um, then I'll talk about a couple different ways you can do it. So let me get the rule. And so if I want to create a, let's see, 17 and a half, that would be half of that is roughly nine. So I go a quarter inch less than nine. And I've, my bit is going to bump right up about there. So I'm going to come down here, and there's going to be the center if I want a 17 and a half inch. So again, I'm right from there to eight and three quarters. Okay. So I'm going to make a little mark here, and we're going to go over to the drill press and make a little quarter inch hole right there. I'm going to get it set up while you're coming over. We won't be here long. Okay, and then I'm going to take the bit with me and back to the bench. Now I'm going to take the bit, and I usually don't like to drill right into the top, but this is the bottom side of my top, and this is going to be actually helpful because I'm going to have a center pin on this top to attach it. So I'm going to have a quarter inch. Now I'm going to get this as vertically as I can. I'm sighting it. How does it look to you? Okay. <laughs> you look up like... All right, now the, the important thing is not to go all the way through, okay? 
I teased that one. I was about a half inch, and this isn't that deep. But um, now that's going to be the pivot point. So let me first get the router on here. I've got my, my little DeWalt. I'm going to use the small one. I've never used this on this in this way, but I made a little outline where I wanted to have it be. But I, all I did was get bring the bit down until it was just on the inside of that circle. Get a couple screws. I'm going to just screw this right in. Now, you can attach this a lot of different ways. I used to double stick tape them a lot. Um, still do sometimes. But if you can run screws through the base somehow, or if you had an auxiliary plate, it's just quicker and easier in some ways, and not as messy as the, the double stick tape. This is tough to get that in there. I gotta get a tighten this one by hand. Okay, that's good. All right, now we have our router bit. Whoops. Does that make a difference? My little foam. Thank you. My little, my little foam uh, wig fell off. All right, so now I've got that. What did I do with the, oh, here it is. All right, so I drilled the pivot point for my router t right uh, with the quarter inch bit. And then I drilled the pivot point in the table. So I can flip the bit around and use the shank. It should fit perfectly. It's tight. <laughs> it should fit perfectly. Hold on a second, it's really tight. Um, I'm going to grab it. Ream it out. That's. This is. Uh, I'm, all I'm going to do is run it. I don't want any play in that, you know? And let me make sure it fits in here. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So for some reason it was binding in this. There we go. It's the perfect pivot. So there it is sticking out there. I'm going to just get it right in there. And now look at that. We've, we've made ourselves a beautiful circle cutter right here. All right. So let me get this plugged in. We're going to plunge. And we're not going to go all the way through. We're just going to go a shallow depth here. In fact, that bit won't reach all the way through. So I know I can't go all the way. All right. Okay, so what I've got in there is just a quarter inch straight cutter. This router comes outfitted with a quarter inch collet. It only will accept quarter inch bits, not the half inch. So, which is fine. We're not gonna overly do it here. And let's see how it sounds if I'm taking too much. Here we go. Hang on. Ready?
All right, there we go. Um, what speed is the router set at? I have it on the higher speed because I've only got a quarter inch bit in there. Um, I thought I was going deeper than that. Let me see if I'm... What? I'm just... What? <laughs> it just I, I wasn't like a ha-ha laugh. <laughs> Surprise. I'm sure. <laughs> well, I amuse you. Well, you so rarely... <laughs> <laughs> Do something like that. No. <laughs> Actually, that was about as much as I'd want to go anyway. There we go. Okay. Michael's asking, would you normally bandsaw first and then trim around? Um, no, I mean, this is there's two ways of doing this, Michael. You can skim it in like this, then bandsaw, and then I can come back and plunge the whole thing, that's one way of doing it directly if you don't want to make a template. Other times, usually I do it this way, where I'll make a template because I know I'm going to use it again. So here's one. Guess what the diameter of this is? <laughs> anyway, the, the center hole is, again, quarter inch. I did it the exact same way. So I just had a 16 inch radius, went around, and you, you cut this out of a uh, quarter inch MDF. Then this is a dead round pattern. So I would put it on a piece of work, mark it with a pencil or whatever, and then bandsaw or jigsaw around, and then I would come back and secure this, use a flush cut bearing against the pattern, and you've got it. But I'm showing you this because this is the method for making this template, or any template, is identical using this piece. This, this method here I'm using is just no template, going straight to the workpiece. So I'm using the router to mark the circle while I'm going. I wanted it to go a little deeper, so then I'm going to bandsaw and we're going to finish it with a straight cutter. Um, I thought it was plunged all the way, but it was hitting something, so, which is just as well, because it would have overworked that bit. So let's go a little more. One more time around the circle. We should get it. Okay, thought it was never going to end. Oh, it's loud. I know. Annoying little noise there. I was watching the. Uh, I was. I was looking through there into the. I could see the sparks. As it was uh, cutting. So Tom, Charlie's asking, do you use the template method so you don't have to drill into the workpiece? Yes, and also, 
as you see, you don't have to take as much material here. So the template method, you just make your template. Yes, you have to have the material. Then you have a dedicated round. But then you can stick it. A lot of times I'll just pin nail it to the bottom side. Um, but I'll use it. First, I'll trace around. And yes, I'll bandsaw usually almost all the waste. So then when you route, you just, you just uh, pin nail your pattern and you're just skimming a smaller amount. See, with this method, this is why I don't use this method much, is um, you're taking more material um, than you need. But I would probably make a template. I'm going to actually probably make a template before I take that apart, and then I'll have one 17 and a half. Did you, um, did you go in the opposite direction on that circle cut? Does it matter? Um, Second time around, maybe. That's a good question. No, I went the same direction each time. I don't think it matters. I mean, you're because it's it's supported on both sides. Um, shouldn't matter. But I don't. Uh, normally, if it wasn't supported on both sides, I'd always be going the direction I showed you. So let's just hit this. That's my head. Okay, so you can see I just, what I first routed is that smooth inner circle, and then I bandsawed, staying off that line. You definitely don't want to hit that or mess up your pretty circle. Um, now, I could have done a very light scribe around the first time, very light, then bandsawed the same way, and then took the same plunge and go all the way. So now you're just taking a skim cut around the circle. You'd have to have it on a sacrificial piece of MDF or something because your bit is going to overextend the workpiece and skim around. So that's another way of doing it. That bit, that router is not, with the bit, is not long enough to get through. So I want to show you another way you can clean these up. Once you've got that, I'm going to just throw a quick straight cutter on here on the router table. So now we've got the router in the table. And so it's, as I look down on it, it's still spinning clockwise. Oh. What's, what, what vibration? What do we, what do you mean? Okay. And then this table is nice. It just dials it down. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, so I would normally do that. That's the first time I think I've ever used the quarter-inch cutter to make a circle like that. Um, I just thought it would be fun to make a small circle cutter. But uh, yeah, the mass of the shank, it gives you greater stability. And so if you're going to make a heavier cut, you want the half-inch shank for sure. So that's where the vibration question comes from? Uh, yeah, probably that's the good question, yeah. Correct. Um, let me see. I'm not seeing it. Um, very minimal. But um, yeah, it's not. The heavier the bit, the bigger the machine. <laughs> it always works better. But so now I just took a straight cutter, and I'm just going to trim this using the bearing against the flat that I made with the first cut. Let's see how this goes. Let's see if we get any tear out against the grain here. Okay, so that's just a Milwaukee router in there, not the good one that you can actually get, a secondary motor, um, which isn't optimal, but it's fine. But you can notice when I'm coming around now, the cutter is circling counterclockwise now because we've got it upside down. So now it's, it's going with the grain here. So you can see how smooth the result is right there. And then as I get over here, see that rougher area right there? It's no, no big deal. That's, we could clean that up. But you notice it's smooth on this quadrant. And then we got a little more roughness here. But it's not really tear. Now, <coughs> this, is the, this is the bottom. So I would actually possibly route a secondary profile here using the probably the half inch round over but not the full amount so I would undercut that and it would sit on a stand something like this one we made last week and this little round top would go on there and it would look pretty nice I think it's a good size so you could make a solid top for this table now if that had a little undercut that edge would look that much lighter um, as it is, it's not even three quarters. Let me see. It's heavy five eighths, meaning like a thirty second heavy of five eighths. So we, I still would want to give it a, a light little round over under. Maybe, yeah, just a little, and it'll look nice with the legs, and we'd have a sweet little table there. All right, so that's some of the basics and considerations of router use. Are there any other questions? Um, oh, sorry, my, my mic was down. The, oh. the bit size and the type of router that was in the table. That is a half inch shank in there. I've got a Milwaukee router in here it's like I was saying earlier it's not the best for a router table I'm trying to see the <laughs> sorry I'm, I have it I'm, I'm over three on finding horsepowers
This is a Jessam table, really nice table. The plate is awesome. This is really one of the big issues because the plate, in some of my earlier routers, router tables, I would have that nice, it was like a plexiglass, 3 8 inch thick, and they always seemed to get a little swale to them. This is dead flat, so I really like it. Super easy adjustment. Um, this is a great router table. Um, but you can buy accessory motors dedicated for it. I'm tying up a router having that in there and an inferior router. But um, so that's one of my things to get is a, a better motor for that bad boy. But that would be, these are, these are nice setups. The fence is beautiful. You've probably seen me use it if you've been watching any length of time. But um, any others? We can put the link to that table in the description. Yeah, sure. Um, what would you do, what's the best way to clean up the rough places on the disc without taking it out of the round? Um, well, I would do it with, I'm actually going to hit it with a little round again, but usually I will card scrape. So you're always pulling in the direction. Let me, here's one of the rough up quadrants right there. Okay, so I don't think I have a super edge. I've been using these maybe here. So I would hit it first with a card scraper. And you're not going to, nobody's going to notice it's out of round because <laughs> you're taking such a little bit off. But you're thinking about going with the grain here. And you can see it's pretty rough right there. But there are other there are other methods where you can use these sanding drums that have flush bit, I mean flush bearings on them as well, which I had here, right here, I've got this. So this this is a sanding drum that you can thread in there a bearing and this you can put in your in your drill press and it spins and the bearing would go against your template or whatever if you have the template on there and you could skim around and follow up if you wanted a straight edge this one I'm just showing you because I would do this before I would just try to sand it because that would take you a good while to sand, but by using this first, and then I go to 150 with the palm sander, and that's pretty nice right now. All that's taken out, but then you've got it smooth on this side here, but it's rough on that quadrant there. So when you're running a, uh, if I was hand holding that with a lighter, as with that secondary light cut, I would have used a climb cut. I didn't want to do it on the table because I where and that's where rather than going in the direction where you're pulling against it, you go with the spin of the bit. And that's where you have to be light and make a nice light cut because when you think about it, the fibers, because you're cutting them and then they're clean behind it, there's not as much of a pull um, or pressure for the cutter to pull fibers out of the wood. And that's why the climb cut will give you a little smoother cut. If you're using a round over or an angled cutter, it's actually hitting at a little more of a sheer angle when you're cutting a round piece. So it's more forgiving than that straight cutter that I was using there. So you usually will get even lighter tear than that when you're using a profiled piece. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out. That was kind of fun for a night. Uh, we didn't do any actual furniture. I've got this project going that I've mentioned a few times with the, the fine woodworking shaker dresser project. We've got that. It's finished like behind, but we can't show you. And then there's a second one almost done. So I've been hard at work with that. So I, take, I really couldn't do a big project tonight, but 
hope you enjoyed that. We are going to be releasing, um, we'll be posting this weekend, you said? The, um, this weekend. If you want to pre-order plans for the shaker dresser, we'll have a little more information about the dimensions and whatnot. We will have those online, and you will be welcome to pre-order the plans, which will be available by the end of the month at the latest. So we are excited to share that with you, and I can't wait for the, that whole series to come out because it's been a lot of fun, and I think you're going to want to build a chest of drawers after that. Yeah, there's a lot coming. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Sorry I went a little long. Wow. It's almost an hour and a half already. But thanks for hanging out once again in the shop. We look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.